I do know that the State Department is raising our concerns about the incident directly with the Russian government, so I'd refer you to them for details on that. Um, in terms of the, the mission of the MQ-9, as I mentioned, it's an ISR platform. Um, you know, these, these aircraft have been flying over the Black Sea region for some time to include before the current conflict started. Uh, it is an important and busy international waterway, uh, and so it is uh, not an uncommon mission for us to be flying in international airspace. And so what kind of precautions do you be taking going forward? Are you going to have uh, armed uh, company aircraft or, well, you know. And was this aircraft armed? Uh, so I'm not going to get into the specific uh, profile of this particular aircraft. As you know, the MQ-9 does have the ability to be armed. Um, it was, again, conducting an ISR mission uh, in international airspace, uh, something that we've been doing for some time. Uh, in terms of uh, the types of tactic techniques and procedures that we take to protect our aircraft, I'm not going to get into the specifics. I think the key point here is that uh, while intercepts in and of themselves are not that uncommon, uh, the fact that this type of behavior from these Russian pilots, that is uncommon and unfortunate and unsafe. And so, uh, again, would echo General Hecker's call on the Russians to continue to fly safely. Thank you. Liz? Was this collision itself an accident on Russia's behalf, and is the U.S. responding as such? Um, so, you know, we are uh, continuing to assess exactly what happened, but I think um, based on the actions of the Russian pilots, it's clear that it was unsafe, unprofessional, um, and I think the actions speak for themselves. Um, what, we, what we saw, again, were, were fighter aircraft dumping fuel in front of this uh, UAV, uh, and then getting so close to the aircraft that it actually damaged the propeller on the MQ-9. Uh, we, we assess that it likely caused some damage to the Russian aircraft as well. Um, to our knowledge, well, we know that the aircraft, uh, the Russian aircraft did land. I'm not going to go into where they landed. Um, but again, it's just demonstrative of uh, very unprofessional, unsafe airmanship on the part of these pilots. Thank you. Uh, one one yep. more question, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, will the U.S. try to recover this drone? Uh, so I'm not, I don't have anything right now to provide in terms of recovery operations. If we have any updates to provide, and we'll be sure to do that. Thanks. David. Is there video of the incident? Are you going to release the video? Um, where in the Black Sea did it happen? How close to Russian airspace? And... Um, did you say that this particular Reaper was unarmed? Uh, again, I didn't say uh, whether it was or was not. I'm not going to get into the particular mission profile of this aircraft. It was conducting an, an ISR mission. Um, in terms of the specifics, David, I'm not going to at this point be able to get more specific other than the Black Sea region in international air, airspace, uh, well, well clear of, uh, of any type of um, yeah, it was international airspace. Um, and then I'm sorry, the other part of your question? The video. video. Yes, so we are going through the, the declassification process now, uh, and we'll keep you updated on that front in terms of uh, imagery associated with this incident. Travis. I'm laser focused on your question. <laughs> that is just a very quick one. Um, you haven't said Reaper, but he said Reaper. Is it accurate to say it's MQ-9 Reaper? Uh, I'm just going to stick with MQ-9. Thanks. Joe. All right, thanks so much, Pat. Um, the, uh, an MQ-9 uh, potentially contains um, sensitive technology. Is the uh, U.S. military undertaking any effort to recover the MQ-9? Is, is it in the waters of the Black Sea? Has Russia recovered it? Um, is there a U.S. naval asset in the in the region that could undertake that recovery? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of what's on this particular aircraft, um, other than again, it's an ISR platform. Uh, because of the damage, uh, we were uh, in a position to have to essentially um, crash it into the Black Sea. Uh, to my knowledge, at this point in time, uh, the Russians have not recovered that aircraft. Um, but again, in terms of um, our recovery efforts, don't have any updates to provide right now. I'd refer you to Navier in terms of what assets they may have in that region. Thank you. Janie? 
Thank you, General. Uh, regarding the North Korea's submarine-launched uh, strategic cruise missiles recently, North Korea has announced that it is possible to mount a nuclear warhead on a strategic cruise missiles. What is the readiness of the United States against escalated provocations such as the nuclear provocation by the North Korea? Let me just make sure I understand. Uh, what's the readiness of the U.S. to respond to a nuclear provocation by North Korea? Um, well, I think we've been very clear uh, that were North Korea to employ a nuclear weapon, it would be the end of the North Korean regime. Uh, but again, our focus continues to be on working very closely with our allies and our partners in the region to deter aggression, uh, to preserve security and stability in the region, and that will continue to be our, our focus. You go to Carla. Just a real quick clarification. What did the fighter jet, what did he, he strike the the MQ-9 with? Was it the wing? Was it the, the tail? Uh, I can't tell you specifically what portion of the aircraft, but uh, it's the fact that it essentially ran into the MQ-9. Okay, thank you. And then just separately on Ukraine, there's reports out there from the, the battlefield that the Ukrainians are running out of munitions. They're having shortages. Uh, is that a concern for the Pentagon, and what's the Pentagon doing to alleviate that problem? Yeah, so as we've been doing since the beginning of this campaign, we're continuing to do everything that we can to ensure that we're meeting Ukraine's needs, whether it's ammunition, uh, whether it's air defense, armor. Uh, you know, you've heard us talk extensively about that. Tomorrow's discussion, of course, will be another opportunity to bring the international community together to focus on Ukraine's most urgent needs, to include ammunition. And so, uh, again, that will continue to be our focus. And, and you've heard Secretary Austin and others say that we're committed to making sure that they have what they need to be successful. Thanks. Is there an assessment that the Pentagon has on why they're running out of ammunition? Is it because they're just expending it too fast? Is it not making it to the battlefield in time? What's your assessment? So, yeah, really. So I'd have to refer you to the Ukrainians to talk about their specific um, efforts to supply their individual units. Uh, again, we're working very closely with them and our international partners to get them what they need. Um, and, and I think it's also important to kind of take a step back and look at the progress that has been made while recognizing the fact that there still is a tough fight ahead, uh, particularly as we go into the, the spring and summer. And so our, our focus, again, is going to be working with national armaments directors, uh, with the Ukrainians to get them the ammunition they need and get that to the frontline units as quickly as possible. Let me go back over to this side of the room. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Can you guide us through the timeline? Sorry. Thank you. Can you guide us through the timeline of the MQ-9 intercept? Uh, we have that the uh, aircraft was struck at 7.03 Eastern time, but uh, how long were the Sukhois with the aircraft beforehand? And were there any radio calls between uh, radio communications, either from the Russians or from the United States? Yeah, so on the latter part of your question, no, none that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, it, I would ask that you... Pentagon update uh, continues there on that breaking news of the Russian uh, jet. Uh, jet. Uh, we are going to continue to follow it here for you. That's going to do it for my time here on the desk. Andy Mack is going to be here with you for the next couple of hours uh, following the latest breaking news from across the country and around the world. Time is when they collided, causing it to crash. So, Kasim. The U.S. forces has had to bring down the, um, the the aircraft. Does that mean that uh, you United States piloted it to the crash site, or yes. was it struck by a missile? Or something? yeah, we brought it down. Okay. Yep. And, and then also, um, is there any U.S. naval um, assets currently in in uh, Black Sea? Again, I'd I'd have to refer you to uh, Navier for any details on particular assets in the region. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the damage to the MQ-9? Was it unflyable, and, and that's why you had to bring it down? Um, and then can you say a little bit more about how often this kind of thing happens in uh, over the Black Sea, that Russian aircraft harass U.S. drones and, and other aircraft? Yeah, so I don't have any statistics in front of me in terms of intercepts, but again, uh, as I highlighted, uh, the fact that uh, – Intercepts of aircraft are not uncommon in and of themselves. It's, it's not obviously a daily occurrence, 
the vast majority of those uh, intercepts are uh, what we would consider safe and professional. Uh, just wanting to see what's there, right? You're flying alongside it to, uh, to be able to see what's there. Um, in this particular case, though, again, uh, they collided with the aircraft, damaging the propeller, uh, and essentially uh, putting in a situation where it was unflyable and uncontrollable, so we brought it down. Thank you. Time for a few more. I'll go here and then to the body. Hi, sir. Thanks. I uh, just wanted to check uh, just to confirm uh, any communication with uh, allies such as Turkey about potential recovery of the uh, drone. And is there any concern that Russia could provide uh, the drone to Iran if it recovers it? Uh, so that, that would be a hypothetical. Uh, again, Russia does not have the drone, so that would be a hypothetical question. Um, in terms of uh, working with allies and partners, I don't have anything to announce here, but if and when we do, we'll be sure to let you know. Thank you. Go to Fadi, and then we'll come back over here to the last two. Yep. Uh, thank you, General. So when, um, I know you don't want to share lots of information, special intelligence information, but are you able to say whether the MQ-9 was flying um, near Ukraine or near the Crimea Peninsula. And then I, I believe you said, if I heard right, that the Russians did not recover the, uh, the drone. However, have you seen any effort by the Russian Navy to try to recover the drone? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so on, on your latter question there, Fadi, I'm not going to get into that. Um, in terms of where it was flying, um, it was well clear of any territory in Ukraine. It was over international, in international airspace, over international water. So, thank you. Nancy. Thank you. Um, during Secretary Austin's visit to Egypt, um, he held meetings with officials, even though all press were banned from covering it. Past defense chiefs, when they've been in a similar situation, have refused to proceed. Um, given that the Biden administration has said that one of its key pillars in terms of foreign policy is that when presented with the um, a choice between autocrats and democracies, that it stands with democracies. Can you help us understand why the secretary decided to proceed with those trips, given the ban, and should we expect that going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our relationship with Egypt is obviously a very important uh, strategic partnership. Uh, the secretary did appreciate the opportunity to meet with his counterparts uh, and talk about that. I will tell you when it come when it came to the press coverage of that portion, uh, having uh, looked further into it, uh, the Egyptians loved, lived up to uh, what they had agreed upon. Uh, some of the lessons learned out of that was in terms of um, making sure that we were on the same sheet when it came to understanding uh, press access, and so we will continue to work that. I'm sorry, could you clarify, the U.S. had agreed beforehand that there would be a ban of journalists? We did not agree to a ban on journalists. We, we agreed to have official photographers. We did have one reporter uh, come into one of the sessions, uh, but then a portion that was going to be open to the press was subsequently not held, and therefore uh, there was not an opportunity to cover that. But again, um, sometimes these meetings are, are very small. Sometimes there's not the opportunity for uh, media to come in. But again, it's something that we've noted and we'll continue to work closely with governments as we visit to ensure that there's press access. Thank you. Sir. Uh, just uh, regarding the budget, uh, for the last few years, the services have pursued a divest to invest strategy, and Congress hasn't necessarily bought into that. This year, the Air Force is looking to retire more than 300 aircraft, double the amount last year. Again, Congress last year didn't give that full amount. Is there a sense that things have changed on the Hill, that there's a willingness to uh, approve greater divestment, uh, or is this now becoming kind of a cat and mouse game of shoot with a higher number knowing you're going to get less to try to get to where you want to be? Uh, well, when it comes to the Air Force budget specifically, I of course would refer you to them to talk in specifics, and, and I don't want to answer for Congress. What I will say uh, is having observed this process, I do think, like anything, there's a continuing dialogue in terms of uh, what the services require to meet their mission requirements and, and working closely with Congress and with the Department of Defense to identify what those offsets might be in order to ensure uh, that we can modernize uh, you know, throughout all the services. And so I think uh, in a lot of ways, uh, as that communication has increased, uh, you're seeing some of the, the fruits of that labor. But again, I'd refer you to the Air Force uh, for specifics on their budget. 
Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.